Welcome back to the podcast on Binding the Bible. This is episode 63, Revelation, A Door Standing Open in Heaven. And in this episode, what I would like to do is to focus in on Revelation 4, verse 1, and talk about a few themes that are really important to keep in mind as we transition into this new section of the book. I do apologize for this week. I've got quite a bit of a cold, and I'm going to try to power through despite how I feel just to be able to give you another episode this week, but my voice definitely sounds a little bit off. Um, but we're going to get through this together, and I think we're going to have a great time doing it. So let's just jump to, jump right in. To begin this week's episode, allow me just to read Revelation 4.1. Here's what it says. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. Now, what I would like to do in this episode is to talk just a little bit about time. And I'd like to begin by just posing the question, are the events that are being described in this verse, and from chapter 4, verse 1, are these events after the events of chapters 1, 2, and 3? Now, It's been my experience in talking with people about the book of Revelation that many people today are as equally concerned with when all of these things will take place as the disciples were in the opening verses of the book of Acts. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it seems that it's hard for us not to concern ourselves with when. And it appears um, that with each new generation, this concern only heightens. And yet for Jesus, the faithful and true witness, his answer for us today in our concern is the same as it was for his disciples in theirs. And here's Jesus' answer to them in Acts one eight: You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. And so there it is. You shall be my witnesses. A perfect summary statement to the point of the church's existence. We are to witness to the faithful witness by shining light on the one who is light. Obsessing over when the end will be minimizes our effectiveness as his witnesses in the present. But Jesus is always concerned with the present and he calls his people to faithfully witness to him in the present. Now, Obviously, this is easier said than done. Many readers of the book of Revelation continue to obsess over the future and how and when everything will unfold. And our passage for this week's episode is where much of the confusion begins. So in verse 1 of chapter 4, John doesn't get two words down before concerns with time are right back in everyone's mind. After this. Now, it would help us to at least read John's entire sentence, but so often people are off to the races when they hear the word after, and they assume that what John is describing next are events that will take place after the events he's described in chapters 1 to 3. Now, on one level, that interpretation makes sense. John can only see so much before he moves on to look at something else. And yet the present question for us is whether John is describing the things that he saw as coming in a particular order or if he is telling us that the things he's describing will come to us in this order. Now, if determining the answer here was left entirely to us, we might debate it forever and people quite literally are debating this forever. Fortunately, as as I pointed out in episode 45, Revelation, he is coming with the clouds. That is not the case for us. We don't have to leave this entirely up to us and to our best arguments. Um, So allow me just to repeat a few paragraphs from that episode as they will prove very helpful here. And I might jog your memory for those of you who have listened to episode 45. I definitely encourage you to re-listen to that episode. It will really help clarify 
some things that I'm trying to say in this episode, but here are just a few paragraphs um, quoted from that episode. In Revelation 1.1, we read, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, this phrase, the things that must soon take place, is not original to the book of Revelation. It actually shows up in Daniel chapter 2. In a conversation Daniel has with King Nebuchadnezzar regarding a dream King Nebuchadnezzar has that he wants someone to interpret for him. Three times Daniel tells the king that his vision deals with what will be in the latter days, or what is to be, or what shall be after this. Now for John to open the book of Revelation by referring to the things that must soon take place, He's cluing us into the fact that he sees his own time and the things he is now discussing as Daniel's latter day prophecies. Latter days, last days, end times, they all mean the same thing. And we are in the last days right now. Additionally, some translations of Daniel 2:28, 29, and 45, which are typically translated in the latter days, have been translated after these things. It's a way of looking forward, of describing something that is yet future to one's current time. John uses this exact language in Revelation 119, what must take place after this? And, if I might add as a side note, and in Revelation 4.1. Now, some interpreters take this to mean yet future to John's time, Hence the belief that much of the book of Revelation takes place in the future with the additional suggestion in the future even for us. But if John tells us that his time is Daniel's latter days and the phrase after these things can be used interchangeably with in the latter days, then John's use of what must take place after this isn't referring to his future. It's referring to Daniel's future which John tells us has now arrived. Daniel's future is our present. Now, I bring this back up in our discussion to keep us grounded in the Bible's telling of the narrative so we don't jump to conclusions every time we hear the word after. And the reason I need feel the need to do this is because the word after isn't the only reason many people today imagine that Revelation 4 begins a section that must take place at some point in the future. Here's the entire opening sentence again. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Now, for many people, heaven is a place Christians will go after they've lived their lives on earth. First, you have earth, and then after you die, you go to heaven. The fact that John is now describing heaven seems to encourage the belief that these events are descriptions of a future reality. We are on earth now. Heaven is coming later. But this is not the way the Bible speaks about heaven. Heaven is simply the domain where God dwells. Earth is the domain where man dwells. And as we looked at in earlier episodes of this podcast, the reason temples were so important was that they were the places where heaven and earth met. They were the spaces where God's domain met man's domain and the two could interact. In fact, the entire coming of Jesus Christ into the world can and should be understood as heaven coming to earth. Jesus brought God's domain into man's domain and forever changed the landscape. In fact, the church today prays the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying that the reality that exists in heaven, where God's will is perfectly carried out, will take place on earth in the same way. We want God, in the words of Isaiah 64, 1, to rend the heavens and come down. And in Jesus, he has. He has brought the blessings of heaven to invade the earth, and he has quite literally 
forever change the landscape. Now, in addition to Jesus bringing heaven to earth and forever changing the landscape, add to all of this that all through Paul's letters, the idea of heaven's reality shaping our lives here on earth is central to nearly everything that he writes. Take Ephesians 1, for example. Paul tells us that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Ephesians 1, 20-21. So, Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places, now. He is reigning there now, perfectly at rest and in complete control of everything. And then in the very next chapter, Paul has the audacity to say this. In a passage quite familiar to many Christians, by the way, although the part I'm about to quote is sadly often missed, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And here's the part I want you to catch. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to hear what Paul is saying. Believers in Jesus Christ have been raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have been given a place of honor in God's domain. Our identity is now defined as a citizen of heaven, as Paul clearly tells the Philippian Christians in Philippians chapter 3. The Father has, according to Ephesians 1, blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And as citizens of heaven, we are given access to heaven's resources now, to heaven's unhindered worship now, and complete access to the presence of God now. This heavenly reality now shapes our identity, and Jesus' way for the church to follow is to allow heaven's reality to shape their understanding of themselves and their place in the world more than they allow earth's reality to do so. This is why Paul, excuse me, this is why Paul exhorts the Colossian Christians to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And so here Paul describes heavenly reality as that which is above and exhorts Christians to set their minds there. The relationship between heaven and earth, then, is spatial, not temporal. In other words, we are called to live out reality now based on an identity that is rooted in a different sphere, not in one that is rooted in a different time. This is how Jesus can exhort the Christians in Smyrna, for example, that we've already looked at, that he knows their poverty, but they are rich. Revelation 2 9. From an earthly perspective, <clears throat> this church has no resources. From heaven's perspective, however, they are the recipients of every spiritual blessing. Hence, they are rich. Now, for these believers to embrace Jesus' words, they have to consciously choose to understand themselves in their heavenly reality, not in their earthly one. Heaven and earth, then, are two different spheres of reality. They are two different spaces out of which to live our lives. In a very real sense then, and I want you to catch this, they are two different spheres of the same reality simultaneously. They are not to be understood along the spectrum of a timeline where we live on earth now, but in the future we'll live in heaven. This is not the Bible's understanding of these two spheres, and it is not the way Revelation speaks about them either. A lot of bad teaching is hurting the church today, and this idea of heaven and earth on a timeline is actually one of the most destructive. It weakens our understanding of who we are in Christ by relegating heaven to some distant future 
and it weakens our recognition of what we are are called to do and who we are called to be in the present because it does not take seriously heaven's relevance to us in the present. If instead, though, we think of heaven and earth in spatial terms, Revelation 1 to 3 describes the church's situation from their perspective on earth, their struggles, their poverty, their persecution, their apathy, their compromise, their self-sufficiency, their failure to love, their challenges, etc. Revelation 4 and following is not introducing us to some future point that no longer concerns the church in the present. Rather, it is introducing us to a different perspective on the same realities described in chapters 1, 2, and 3. So, instead of taking after this I looked and interpreting it to mean things that are coming at some point in the future, think of it like this. The first thing John sees in his vision is of the Son of Man himself, followed by this Son of Man's address to each church. Then John sees something else, which helps complete his vision. It would be like me walking into a friend's home for a Thanksgiving meal. When I first enter their front door, <clears throat> my eyes are drawn to all of their decorations. A fully lit Christmas tree, the smell of cinnamon-scented candles, mistletoe hovering over each doorway, garland gracing the top of their piano, fake snow and tea candles lining their windowsills, etc., etc. It's just breathtaking. Then, after this, I looked and saw the dining room table. The steam rising from the turkey recently placed there, along with a heaping dish of mashed potatoes, multiple bowls of stuffing, various casseroles, and no less than four different homemade pies. Now, the fact that I didn't see the dining room table until after I saw the Christmas decorations doesn't mean that the one takes place after the other. Both were present in my friend's home the entire time. It's just that I can only take in so much at once. And so I see what I see and proceed to describe it in as coherent a way as I can. Describing the Christmas decorations gives you a good indication of what walking into my friend's house was like. But once I see and then describe the dining room table and everything on it, it further completes the picture for you. Both the decorations and the table are there together at the same time. It's just that I need a few moments to take it all in and a few more to describe it for you. That's what's going on in Revelation 4.1. And the clearest way I know this is what John has in mind is actually found right in verse 1. After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Now we've talked about after this and we've even talked a little bit about heaven. Now let's talk about the title of this episode. A door standing open. And let me remind you in terms of our comparison between Revelation 1, 2, and 3, and then Revelation 4, that this is not the first time we've heard of an open door in the book of Revelation. And I think this provides a little bit of a link for us because this has already been referenced. Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia, Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. Revelation 3, 8. In episode 61, Revelation, Pillars in the Temple, we talked about this open door being these believers' open access to the kingdom of God. Jesus, as the holder of the keys of the kingdom, grants access to his kingdom and to his presence to whomever he will. And to the Christians in Philadelphia, that small, seemingly insignificant, and harshly persecuted minority of believers, Jesus offers them access to his kingdom access to heaven's resources, and access to the very presence of God himself. This access is identified as an open door. And here, John is simply experiencing that access. There is an open door in heaven, and he is invited to walk through it. The Philadelphian believers can rightly understand what John is about to describe for them are the very things that they are given access to by Jesus. What John sees when he walks through the open door will shape for everyone what the heavenly reality Paul so often spoke about actually looks like. Why are believers told they are rich when from earth's perspective they're poor? This next part of John's vision will help answer this. 
How might a view of heaven shape believers' lives on earth? This next part of John's vision will help answer this. What does it mean for Christians to conquer as they've been invited to do in every one of the addresses to every one of the churches? The next part of John's vision will help answer this, particularly when we come to Revelation 5. How can Christians be assured that if they do conquer, they'll be rewarded for their efforts in the end, as every one of those seven churches are offered rewards for their conquering? The next part of John's vision will help answer this. So much of the Christian life is dependent upon knowing what Jesus has made true of us in the heavenly places. And Jesus knows that the church will be unable to faithfully witness to him in their various places on earth unless they are completely assured of his rule and reign in the heavens. They need a true view of him to complete the picture to round out their understanding of the world and their place in it. We've seen things from Earth's perspective in Jesus' address to each of the seven churches. And to some of the churches, the earthly perspective is ugly. It looks dismal and it looks weak. But now, through John's eyes, we are going to see reality from heaven's perspective. We are going to join John as he is invited to come up here to set his mind on things above where Christ is. And in the weeks to come, we will look at length into what John sees when he walks through that open door. And I couldn't be more excited to explore it with you. Revelation 4 and 5 are two of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible. And when read rightly, as I will do my absolute best to help us all read them rightly, It will absolutely change our lives. But for now, that's all for this week. See you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in this week to the episode. I just really appreciate you plowing through with me. Again, I'm sorry for the clearing of my throat and the raspy voice, but we did make it through. And I know this week was a little shorter and that's, a big help to me. So thank you so much for those who continue to listen in. Please share this with friends or family. I know over the holidays, you're going to be crossing paths with a lot of people. Feel free to share with them a single episode or a handful of episodes that have challenged you or that have helped reshape your thinking. And please, I encourage you to leave me a rating and or a review on Apple iTunes as it will help others to be able to find this podcast. And then I would also like to thank you once again to the handful of you who've decided to support me financially from month to month. I know that Anchor makes that very possible for you to follow a link at the bottom of the show notes, even in this episode or any episode. And some have decided to support this episode or this podcast for 99 cents or 4.99 or some of you even for 9.99 a month. And that has been a huge encouragement to me. It's allowed me to go out and to purchase resources and microphones to continue to make this podcast better for you. I would love to hear from you if you've got any feedback or any comments or questions or ideas of things you'd like me to address. Feel free to email me at unbindingthebible at gmail.com. I'd love to interact with you on any level through this podcast as we keep exploring the Bible together, looking for ways that Christians maybe consciously or unconsciously have bound the Bible in their interpretations, and which is one of the main reasons we are tackling the book of Revelation as we are. But this has been a lot of fun. Despite even not feeling well, I just really didn't want another week to go by without being able to present you with something because this has become really important to me and a really um, special part of my life over the last 15 months. So thanks, thanks a lot. Have a great week.